Oh no, she's muted. Muted. Kathleen, you're, you've muted <laughs> Sorry. yourself. Sorry. Oops. <laughs> Hi, Kathleen. I'm in Vancouver. I'm Ella Maya. I'm in what's now known as Vancouver, but it's the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. And everyone who's watching has been too shy to introduce themselves. <laughs> but if you still want to, go ahead. Well, we have our editor, Brett Party, who's going to be live tweeting. He's here. And so, and Laura Ann Harris, who's written for us and is a, a theater maker from, well, she's all over the place now. She was in Toronto. Um, I think now she's in the US. She was in Victoria for a while. Like how we are introducing Laura for her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was on our mouthpiece episode of the podcast. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, so I believe we are live on YouTube. So Orla, if you want to start introducing, we can. Sure. sure oh, thing. She says she's in Vancouver, Washington, says Laura. Okay, well, hello and welcome to Lockdown Film School, which is a weekly series of discussions with filmmakers in various fields. Um, I'm Ola Smith, the executive editor of Seventh Row, and my co-host today is Alex, who's our editor-in-chief. Um, and this week, we are delighted to be joined by um, our largest cast of filmmakers yet. Uh, we have here with us the filmmakers behind the Body Remembers When the World Broke Open, Kathleen Hepburn and Elmaya Telfeathers. And we have the filmmakers behind Mouthpiece, the writer stars in Mouthpiece, uh, Nora Sadava and Amy Nostakin. Uh, so first of all, we'll facilitate a discussion between all four of our guests. And at the end of the session, we will invite you, our viewing audience, to ask questions um, and Actually, uh, you can, I mean, there's a, a whole bunch of options for how to ask questions. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can type them into the comments. And if you're watching on Zoom, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, which you can click on and ask a question. We also um, will let you ask your question live with your audio and your camera if you want to. So just specify if you want us to read it out or if you want to answer yourself. Um, so you can do that if you so wish at the end of the session, or you can just submit your questions as we speak and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, so before we get started, um, I'll quickly introduce our guests and their collaborations. So regarding The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open, it's a film based on a real life encounter that Elmaya Telford has had with a young indigenous woman on the streets of Vancouver. When it came to interpreting the film for the screen, she brought her friend Kathleen Hepburn, who directed the acclaimed Never Steady, Never Still, on board as a collaborator, since Hepburn has more experience with fiction filmmaking, whereas Tailfeather's experience has been largely in other genres, including documentary and experimental film. Um, the film premiered at the 2019 Berlin Film Festival and built up steam at the 2019 Toronto International Film Festival before it was released by Array Now in collaboration with Netflix worldwide. And the film was nominated for six Canadian Screen Awards and won three, including Best Director for Hepburn and Tail Feathers. And then uh, regarding Mouthpiece, Mouthpiece is based on a 2015 Canadian play written by Amy Nosbach and Nora Sadava, who run the theatre company Quote Unquote Collective. They're both award-winning directors, writers and performers and have worked in both Canada and internationally. And the play was originally performed in Toronto in 2017. Jodie Foster brought them to LA to perform the play for a limited run. And the play was also staged at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Uh, in 2018, they teamed up with director Patricia Rosema to adapt their own play for the screen and Mouthpiece premiered at the 2018 Toronto International Film Festival. And it was later named as one of Canada's top 10 films of the year. So. Now over to Alex. All right. Um, well, so I just wanted to get started about hearing sort of how each of you started, um, got to know each other and started collaborating together. 
Um, do you guys want to start, Amy and, and Nora? Sure. <laughs> we we met be, uh, making the play Mouthpiece, uh, though it wasn't called that or or about what it became at the time. Um, and we met because we have similar um, theatrical training, which is devised physical theater, which just means you create up on your feet through improvisation rather than at a desk writing. Um, however, it ended up being a, a sort of hybrid of, of, of writing on the page and improvisation and musical composition and choreography, quite a blend. But the tenets of physical theater is what we draw on. And so I, I knew there was a woman in town who had this training and I had an idea for a show. And so I said, why don't we get in a room for five days? And then three years later, we had a play. <laughs> That's the short of it. Within that three years, we also had a feminist awakening, um, which ended up being what we realized that's what the play had to be about versus what it, how it started. And that is often the case with devised work, is that you start with one thing and you end up somewhere completely different. Um, the processes are long. It takes us about three years to make a show. Um, but yeah, that's how we met. And um, Maya and Kathleen? Um, well, it's, it's funny that you're wearing uh, the imaginative <laughs> shirt, Alex. Um, I, I met uh, Kathleen's partner, Tyler Hagen, who ended up uh, being one of the producers on The Body Remembers. I met Tyler at Imaginative. He's, uh, he's a Métis filmmaker and producer. Um, and so through Kathleen's partner, Tyler, I, I met Kathleen and we'd work together uh, sharing a studio space um, in this artist run uh, center here in, in Vancouver. And so I'd watched Kathleen work and sat in a room with her many times, just, you know, talking about the state of the world and, and our work. And um, when I saw Never Steady, Never Still, I was just so blown away by how beautiful that film is. Um, and uh, as, as Orla said, um, The Body Remembers is inspired by an experience that I had. And most of my experience with directing uh, was in documentary. And I, I started as an actor. And so I have a fair amount of experience working on, uh, on sets as an actor, but not so much directing. Um, and I really love the process of collaboration. I've done it um, numerous times. And so I knew that um, in wanting to tell this story that uh, a collaboration would be the best way to go about it. So um, that's how it happened with, with Kathleen and I. And yeah, here we are. So, um... I guess I know that, so Mouthpiece is, is directly an adaptation of your stage play, but I know um, that there's a lot of ways in which you were inspired by theater for The Body Remembers. Um, in part, the sort of, the fact that you shot an order and that it's uh, to look like one take. Um, so I'm just wondering if you guys can talk a little bit about how um, working in theater has inspired you and inspired um, your films. Do you want us to go first? Yeah, yeah, go for it. <laughs> All right, I'll start and then Kathleen can. Uh, um, so like I said, I started as an actor and um, I love theater for so many reasons. Uh, the first being that there's a certain like kinetic energy and magic that, that comes from live performance and being able to have an audience present. Um, and also the, uh, the, the tension, uh, the creative tension of the possibility of failure, um, which I, I find really exciting. And um, it, it creates this like extreme focus that I don't think you necessarily have when you're shooting a film in a conventional way. Um, and so at coming in at coming to it as an actor, um, film is generally shot out of chronological order. Um, and you don't have, you're lucky if you have any rehearsal time, whereas in theater, um, you get to work with, with the material for weeks um, 
if you're lucky, you know, three or four weeks or more, um, and you grow sort of an intimate knowledge with the with the text, and then also you're able to build um, a sense of trust with the other performers, and um, you're able to try things in, in various ways, um, and none of that is is an option with film generally, and so we ended up. Um, hiring Violet Nelson or cast Violet Nelson as our lead and she had never acted before. Um, and just knowing the weight of that performance um, and the, the, uh, the challenge that it would be for a first time actor um, to throw her into sort of the conventional way of making a film by doing one scene here and then another scene there. Um, we thought that one of the most supportive ways to go about it would be to, um, have a four week rehearsal process like theater um, and give Violet the opportunity to, to, to get comfortable in her own skin as an actor, um, to give all of us the opportunity to try things and, and fail maybe, or find something new um, and, uh, and then bring in that like same sort of kinetic energy of a continuous performance. Um, so maybe Kathleen, could talk about the technical side of it and how that made things really interesting. Yeah, um, so my experience is not, I don't have any theatrical experience. So this was all, this process was pretty new to me, the rehearsal to have that sort of length. I'm used to like two days of rehearsal um, before filming. So that was really amazing to have that time. And um in terms of the technical I think there is some similarities when you're shooting on film as well because of the higher stakes of of wanting to get it right because every shot costs you know it's not it's not just uh data you're using you're actually using material and and uh, spending money with each take so there is like sort of this um I would say more of like a preciousness to to each frame so I think that is sort of similar to theater in that like there is this sort of sense of like Maya said a possibility of failure um but the the shooting of the film was sort of like I sort of liken it to a, a bank heist sort of feeling um I was because we had such a long rehearsal process pretty much all of our choices were made um during that time so once we started shooting I was really just uh putting myself in the in the, the seat of the viewer and just sort of watching the process because I couldn't stop it once it started. And I was just in a, a van following behind them when they're in the taxi and jumping out of the cab and running and hiding behind, you know, a staircase while the camera goes by. And um, so it was very exciting <laughs> and um, scary. But uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was really wonderful. And I think the whole crew sort of felt this need to to be on and to perform at, at this higher level because the stakes were quite high. Uh, I just want to add one thing. This is in relation to what Amy was saying um, about your process of writing. I think that's really awesome. I, I like this idea of like creating the story and, and having it shift from one thing to another. And I think that's the kind of writing that I really that I that really inspires me because you're not trying to control it so much you're letting it be free and yeah I just thought that was that was uh really great <laughs> yeah I mean so we once we actually premiered Mouthpiece um Amy and I work in theater have a theater company had both been working in theater for the better part of our lives and never thought about doing film, never had the intention of doing film, didn't have any skills <laughs> regarding film. And uh, the beautiful thing about theater is that it's a metaphorical space already. When the audience walks in, they know that there's a suspension of disbelief. You're all in a room together, you're breathing the same air. So when the play opens, we're sitting in an empty bathtub in white bathing suits and we say everything out loud. We say, I woke up this morning, my mom died. Last night I was out, I got drunk, I masturbated. I checked my messages and found out she's dead. And it's funny, I was going back to, um, I found the like test, the camera test that we did when Patricia 
first approached us about working on this and but we were like we might be really bad actors on camera we have no idea so we wanted to try shooting something to make sure we didn't blow it um because we were also not precious it was like we can write this and then someone else can be in it obviously it would be great if it was us but if if it's better that someone else does it that's fine um, and when we first started shooting the camera test, we were still saying a lot of stuff out loud. So it was, we were lying in a real bathtub full of water, but still saying, I'm in my tub. <laughs> and then slowly over time, what we started to understand was that visuals do it and you don't have to say everything out loud, which to us became this like huge revelation and a huge gift is like, for people who work in physical theater, the less you say, the better on screen. Like some of our favorite films and a lot of the stuff we watch now, there's so little dialogue and it's so fun and freeing to transition from a space where text is usually the, the main mode of communication, not in our work necessarily. We do a lot of abstraction um, in storytelling, but in general, the theater, there's much is, much is reliant on the text to a, a form where we could be just a, a lot looser about how the words were constructed and a lot and and keep a lot even though it had to be adapted keep a lot of the physicality um and the the uh when Patricia approached us her main the thing that really clicked for her why she wanted to make the movie was the metaphor of two people playing one um that was something that she'd never seen before and that really resonated for her personally. She was like, it feels like, I feel that. And so maintaining that physicalized metaphor for the whole movie was the whole motor. So it felt like a really risky, uh, based on what producers and financers were telling us choice in that they didn't want that to be. They were like, you can't do that. What are you talking about? Um, but also felt really like the reason we were doing it. So there was, um, there was that kind of great meeting of the two mediums that we got to experience as it was evolving. I'll also add that Patricia gave us a really beautiful provocation, a gift in telling us because we were, the three of us were writing together and we were sort of going through adapting the stage play and we just kept going like yeah but can you do that C but could you you know we'd come up with something that we thought was hilarious or something we say but can you do that and she was like listen kids <laughs> uh the fact that you have no film training is your greatest asset because you're not you have no rule book and and that was really liberating and i and throughout from that point on for the duration of the process, we thought in those terms. And, uh, and I continue to think that way, approaching any kind of screen work that why should I adhere to a pre-existing set of terms that weren't made by me or for me? Uh, so yeah, I'm really, we're both really grateful to Patricia for allowing it, giving us that freedom and really playing with us and not playing, you know, she, she really had us on board at every it was really a collaboration. It wasn't just because she had so much um, experience and she is who she is. It really felt like a true collaboration, which is just such a, was such a gift. I think we're totally spoiled now because as we hear, most film sets are nothing like that. And uh, <laughs> so I don't know if we can ever go on. I think we had a sort of a similar experience in terms of rewriting the rule book Maya, would you say? We, we heard a lot of the, you know, from financers and stuff that their big fear was the one take and could we pull it off and what was our plan B and just doing, filming in this process sort of allowed us to rethink everything about the way we were making the film and it was really liberating and exciting. So when you say rethink everything, what do you mean? What did, how did you end up rethinking everything? Um, I would say, well, one of our um, objectives in, in making this film was to create an atmosphere of production that was 
um, non-extractive is a word we use a lot um, when talking about it, but a more uh, level playing field in terms of, of creative involvement of the crew and the cast and um, not having this sort of militaristic approach to filmmaking, which I think is often the case. You know, there's a lot of um, hierarchies and stay in your lane and, and don't step out of outside of that role. Um, and so we just we just thought, you know, we're doing this completely differently than other film sets work. We might as well just, um, you know, like do do everything the way that we want to do. So we had um, uh, a mentorship, a youth mentorship uh, as part of our production, and we had 11 uh, youth involved uh, at every step of, of production and um, yeah it was just it was just the whole thing kind of we had to rethink what our values were in terms of, of storytelling and how we how we took control of this um, ship I guess. Can I ask is like how big was the group of people collaborating. I just want, I'm asking because I love that, like reclaiming that the process can be holistic and a part of the product, that it's not just it, something that we've encountered in being in the film industry for the first time is that it is much more of an industry and, and uh, economic proposal than in theater, there just isn't money. <laughs> so no one expects it to come back to them. And I, I wonder how, like how, you know, when you watch a film, like I just watched uh, this film called Wanda that was made in the seventies by Barbara Loden, which is amazing. It's three people on the crew and they just did whatever the hell they wanted. Um, but I wonder like, as it gets bigger, does that challenge get larger to maintain the reins and, and maintain the independence within the, the mode of how you're operating? Do you want to go away? <laughs> um, yeah, yes, it does. It does get uh, more complicated. And I think what was really great for us is that we had a, a whole a team of producers and um, collaborators that were all really invested in, in the story and the subject and the way, you know, everyone was sort of on board at the top level, which allowed us to sort of set an environment that um, everyone could could be invested in, if that makes sense. Maya, do you, I don't know. Yeah, um, well, you know, this is a story about two indigenous women in, in East Vancouver. And uh, as an indigenous filmmaker, um, you know, I've been quite involved with the community in terms of advocating for building sustainability in the film industry for Indigenous people and um, building capacity. Um, so there's there are a lot of really talented writers and directors and producers, but we don't have enough um, Indigenous people working in the key technician position. So, you know, sound recordists, editors, uh, gaffers, you know, all of those departments that we sort of um, forget about in some ways um, when when we're talking about making films and um, having indigenous people fill those roles I think makes an incredible difference in terms of the type of the type of film that's made so um, we were unable to uh, find very many indigenous people to fill those technic technical positions um, because there's not very many and scheduling, all of those things. And so um, in an effort to build capacity and to um, support, uh, you know, building um, a future in the industry where there are more indigenous people working in these technical positions, we did this um, indigenous youth mentorship project. Um, and so TELUS uh, generously gave us a grant to, um, hire 11 young people to work in all of these key departments in a collaborative way with the head of each department. Um, and so these young people were mostly in their 20s, but like all the way up to the age of 30. Um, 
And we also did a script workshop early on with um, young Indigenous women who had been through foster care. Um, because like Kathleen said, it was really important for us to not replicate um, extractive forms of storytelling. So, um, you know, when it comes to representations of marginalized populations on screen, um, there is often, uh, there are often extractive forms of telling these stories. So it's often a not a member, a, a, a person who's not a member of that community telling the story. So they're looking at it through their own lens. So there's often like a fetishistic approach to it. It's very othering. Um, and there's a lack of, of um, actually giving back to the community or involving the community in any real capacity. Um, and so Kathleen and I, neither of us grew up in foster care. Uh, we come from, you know, at least having the privilege of growing up with two parents in, in the household who are both our parents, <laughs> you know, like, um, and so it was really important for us to, to know that and recognize that privilege and to, to recognize who we are as people um, and to know that in the process that we were consulting with um, Indigenous women who had had that lived experience. Um, and so I think all of those things were um, part of a larger effort to go about making this film in a way that didn't replicate these harmful and toxic ways of making films, which is like so common in the industry. Um, and it, you kind of get caught up in it on these bigger shows where it's like every, every moment feels like the most important moment ever because there's so much money on the line and, um, and you kind of forget that you're telling a story about humans, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so, yeah, we, we were um, making a great effort the whole time to, to try and just do this differently. Um, I'm wondering a bit about your, I mean, you've talked now a little bit about your writing process, um, uh, Maya, where you were involving, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, where your like consultation process, but I'm wondering a bit about like, how, how do you write a screenplay when you're working as, when you're working as collaborators? Like, how does that, how does that work? And what was your sort of process for these films? Um, Amy and Nora, do you want to start? Well, for us, it was, it felt very straightforward because we had the, the source text of the play. And then on top of that, Nora and I spent three years making the play and over four years touring that play. So we knew this protagonist, Cassandra, inside and out, you throw anything at at us and we could answer for her. We knew how she ticked. She was also quite autobiographically reflections of the two of us combined. Um, so the, the play was really difficult. I mean, devising work, if you've never experienced it, is a lot of hair pulling and head bashing against the wall because you're starting with nothing and you're, and you're in a room with collaborators or a collaborator and you, you booked the studio for eight hours and oh God, <laughs> maybe I should choose a different career. Um, but, but when we started the film, it felt really easy. And, and the three of us, uh, Nora and I and Patricia, you know, luckily have pretty much the exact same sense of humor and ethos. And so it, it felt really, uh, it felt really easy. That's not a really good answer. <laughs> But I mean, um, on, on a technical level, <laughs> writing collaboratively, I think for every person is different. Um, the way Amy and I write collaboratively is just by like talking and telling a lot of stories and exploring different ideas, oftentimes on our feet. But when, when we were sitting down to do the screenplay, we were with Patricia and one person would have the computer in their hands and everyone else would just be chatting. And oftentimes it's just like, I had this experience. Then you explore the 
themes of what whatever that experience was and then someone makes a joke that's really funny and makes everyone laugh and then you write it down and then talk about you know we we took the play pulled it apart discarded what we knew wouldn't work like for example in the play the character has no voice literally she wakes up and she's lost her voice she can't speak in the film we knew that wouldn't fly because there's one main character in the movie and we needed her to have some (laughs) dialogue and interact with people so we decided that would go and then we pulled things out of the recycling bin that we had written for the play that never made it in because the play's a tight 60 minutes. We knew we needed more material. So it was like a sequence in a grocery store that we had written that we pulled back out and made into a part of the movie. And it it's it's not the our collaborative writing process is very informal. It's like oftentimes sounds if it, if someone was listening it would sound like ch- three women chatting and then there's a screenplay on the other side of it which i think allowed we also didn't know patricia when we started writing it so it allowed us to also earn each other's trust while writing and um and really like jive on each other's sense of humor and and sense of tragedy and desires for what the story meant and and what what was at the core of it. Um, For us, uh, we, I mean, the film was inspired by an experience that I had. So we had that to work from, um, but it was important that we, you know, that we fictionalized the character of Rosie and also Isla and, and made it our own. So um, I wrote the treatment uh, from that original experience and Kathleen and I talked about how to fictionalize and adapt. Um, and so Kathleen wrote the first draft of the script. Um, she's such a talented writer um and then we used that first draft and and worked from there um sometimes we would get together in the room and write together sometimes we would you know share the the screenplay back and forth and and work on it ourselves um it was a very uh fluid process and there was never really like a specific way of doing it i think it um it just sort of like found its way into <laughs> into being um, based on whatever we felt at that point in the process was the best way to go about it. Um, and I think we learned a lot. I certainly learned a lot about collaboration and, and what works and what doesn't work in terms of writing together. And um, I think the most uh, fruitful moments in the writing process were when we were together in the room, actually talking to each other in real life sort of thing. I think that was the most, um, those were the most beneficial, fruitful days for collaboration. I just had a thought, I I hadn't thought about this in a while, but I, it's another uh, reflection of how, uh, I don't know, generous or unique, I think, I believe uh, the collaborative process of this film is, but I'm just recalling, remember, remember Nora, it was, while we were shooting and we were kind of rehearsing a scene up in some vacant office and because we were writer performers we could change (laughs) the dialogue at any point and the dialogue of other characters when we were watching and I just remember rewriting a really that final I mean like a pivotal climax of dialogue between Cassandra and her mother and going this is you know she she'd never say that. I would never say it, you know, or, or this isn't exactly what we want to say or where we want her to go, the theme to go. And we totally rewrote it. And uh, I can't, I, I, because it is our, was our first film, uh, it's hard for me to imagine any other way where you don't have that free. I mean, I know like every other film is the other way, but the freedom to know your character so well that you can oh, and just the, the the fact that there are so few um 
writer writer performers in film exist, but it's just, it's pretty rare. And um, so that collaborative and intuitive writing happened not only till the very end, but even like during. Um, I know there's a lot of improvisation in film, but this was sort of like thoughtful rewriting even during like all the way through the process, which is how we work in theater. And we managed to, we managed to carry that into our film experience as well. Um, well, I was gonna ask about the sort of collaboration through performance, because I think both films really center around two characters or in the case of Cassandra, two actors playing the same character. Um, and I imagine that that requires like like a real sort of synchronicity between the actors and also between like actor and director. Um, and so I'm wondering, I mean, obviously Nora and Amy, you had years of working together um, to support you, but I'm wondering about how that worked for both films. And maybe you can talk a little bit about that in the rehearsal, um, Maya too. Do you wanna go ahead, Maya? So this is the, the, the multiple panelists, is, it, it's a, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, where to begin? Um, I think just the fact that we had the luxury of four weeks of rehearsal was, was such an incredible process. Like, uh, I, I almost, I not at the risk of sounding like a little hokey and out there. It, it's the, it sometimes felt like a spiritual process being in that space. Cause it was often just, um, Violet, Kathleen and I in the room together working through the text and um, and sometimes our our directing mentee Jade Baxter who's this phenomenally talented young indigenous filmmaker um, and Kathleen and I actually we went and saw a therapist <laughs> um, to learn about uh, trauma-informed tools on, on how to work with Violet because um, Violet talks about it openly she's had a uh, lived experience very similar to uh, to Rosie. Um, and so Kathleen and I wanted to do our best to um, take care of her, create a safe space and not cause any harm to her throughout the rehearsal process and, um, and have her ready to perform in a way that again, didn't do any harm. Um, so I don't know, I, f I feel like it was just such an incredible luxury and, um, uh, yeah, spiritual experience being in that space together with just, just the three or four of us um, and being able to like get so intimately familiar with the text and each other and build trust and um, make decisions together and yeah, and just take care of each other in the process. And it wasn't always perfect and it wasn't always easy. And there were times when Kathleen and I had disagreements about stuff, um, but I feel like it just made the work that much stronger in, in you know, getting through those, those speed bumps, I guess, on, on the, along the way. And I think the, there was also a lot of, um, changes to the script that happened because of casting Violet, because if you read the script, you wouldn't necessarily imagine um, someone like Violet um, as that character. But once we found her and she was just so special, um, going through this rehearsal process allowed us that time to sort of create a new version of, of the character of Rosie um, working with Violet and, and how she responded to Maya and um, like Amy said, right up until the end of rehearsals, we were rewriting scenes um, to, to sort of make it because she wasn't an actor. And I think um, the closer we could get it to an experience that she could really understand emotionally, um, the, the better the dialogue sort of came out. So yeah, there was a lot of, of uh, rewriting throughout that stage as well. And she was only 17 when we made the film. So we were also working with a very young, a young person. And, um, you know, when you're at that age, there's just like, 
so much you still have to figure out about yourself and the world around you. And so um, it, it was a really complicated process. And um, yeah, I, I'm so grateful we found Violet because she's, she's such a um, special person and brought a sort of like really beautiful um, gravity and beauty to her performance that I don't think anyone else could have achieved. I would say that, um, you know, it, Amy and I having had three years in rehearsal and four years on the road of not only like um, working together professionally, but figuring each other out emotionally and being, being there with each other through intense times in our lives. But, when we when we were on set making the film there were some times where it was like patricia was amazed at the fact that she could ask for something and we were able to slip into it together so easily and i think that that was such a just time which i i understand is like so impossible and something that blew my mind was day players and people who came onto set to play roles that I had never met before and were playing members of my family. <laughs> and it was so challenging for me because in theater, you know people, you, you, you build trust, you rehearse, and you understand the meat of, of what's between you as humans before you build the meat of a scene. And to me the the like skill of coming into something totally cold with no relationship is like mind blowing <laughs> that that people are capable of that and i think that it's like like i don't know how it's possible because funding is all, always the problem but like even just having an hour of rehearsal would change so much of of the way that people are engaging with each other and you know, I, I only say that based on this one experience of how, the difference between, you know, Amy and I lying in a bathtub naked together and Patricia asking us to like wrestle essentially and trusting that Amy's not going to drown me, but she is holding my head under the water and I know this is safe, but I can, I can go into it. And I'm sure in the case of your guys' film, the, it's so vulnerable, like what a vulnerable movie. And to be asking anyone to go there like how could you have done that without four weeks of rehearsal how could you have done that without the time that it takes to to learn someone so I think that um yeah I just I think a lot about how how that is built in and when that's not how you can bridge that gap quickly and there's so many cases where I can just imagine it going wrong like or people getting heard in weird ways or not having trust and you hear the stories like the industry is full of stories of people being taken advantage of and they're just in put in shitty situations with someone they've never met before and that sucks so to hear that you guys were insisting on a different kind of process is really inspiring Thank you. And relatedly, I guess, I think that both films are really smart about women's bodies and they're really stories that get really intimate with the characters and their lived experience like through their bodies. And I guess I'm wondering about how that comes into play with your like your performance, but also I guess your relationship with the cinematographer and director or as a director. Sorry, I know there's so many, nobody knows who to start. Um, <laughs> Kathleen and, and Maya, do you guys want to, one of you want to start? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a huge, huge part of this film, was thinking about the body and um, thinking about sovereignty over the body, especially for Indigenous women and mothers. Um, so, it, 
yeah, I mean, we had a cin- we we had wanted uh, a female cinematographer. And we talked about it a lot, um, but Norm Lee, who who was our cinematographer, is such an incredible human being and uh, so talented. And um, I had worked with him before and really really trusted him. Um, and I said to Maya, he's basically like a woman, um, just because of all his positive traits. Um, so we started working with him and um, yeah, I guess having someone that was so gentle was really important. Uh, maybe Maya could talk more about it, um, being in front of the camera, what that meant, but we really wanted to I don't know, I'm losing my thought here, but I think talking about um, choices and and who has the privilege to make choices in terms of the body and how do different bodies get treated um, by especially non-Indigenous people in this situation. Um, when Rosie's at the bus stop and she's uh, obviously in distress and no one is stopping for her, um, we both sort of felt like if if Isla was in that position, that people would have stopped, you know. Um, so thinking about how women's bodies are treated, um, I'm just rambling here, Maya. You jump in. <laughs> that was really great, though. Um, yeah, it's for us. We always consider, you know, sovereignty of the body and what does that mean, um, especially for Indigenous women. Um, I think Indigenous uh, women, Indigenous motherhood has always been perceived as a threat to settler colonialism uh, because indigenous women uphold our communities. Um, indigenous women are, are everything. Um, and that should include indigenous girls and two-spirit uh, individuals. Um, and so the film was, was all those things. It was about collisions of class and, and race I love someone who benefits from light skin privilege. She has a university education. She's, uh, you know, middle class and um, didn't grow up in, in foster care. And so it's also about the ways that um, systems of oppression and settler colonialism um, has damaged Indigenous women's bodies and the way that that has um rippled into fracturing of our families and communities and how that was a systemic um, choice uh, by the settler colonial government. These policies were put in place to um, quite literally kill the Indian and the child and um, and to uh, disempower us as nations because before colonialism, before, before settlers arrived, you know, we had our own systems of, of governance and justice systems and um, uh, kinship systems. And I think women were, were, were held up and revered within our communities. Children were taught in very different ways. Um, and so there's kind of this interesting thing with, with our film in regards to, to feminism. Um, so often when we talk about, um, about birth control and abortion and the right to choose, all of those things are, uh, are really important. Um, but also with indigenous women, indigenous families, um, the right to motherhood has been taken away from us in so many cases. I mean, forced sterilization, uh, uh, on Indigenous women's bodies has happened all the way up until the 2000s um, and Indigenous children continue to be removed from our communities and placed into foster care systems at rates higher than that of the, even the height of the residential school era and so for Rosie um, it was always important for us to remember that she wanted to be a mother um, and that she had the right to be a mother and that that decision to be a mother um, is one of the most radical, beautiful, um, loving decisions we could have made as, as writers and, and filmmakers. And so um, that, that was also really important to us. So it was about all of those things and, and, and then also thinking about um, indigenous women and girls um, being our primary audience and watching the film and feeling, and feeling seen and feeling heard and knowing that they deserve space on screen um, and that um, our bodies 
uh, are beautiful and um, and deserve more than being perceived uh, through a lens of, of victimhood. Yeah, and I would just add one thing, just in relation to the title, um, which is The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open, and thinking about how our bodies carry intergener intergenerational trauma. Um, and for Indigenous women, this idea of, of that first contact when, when things sort of shattered open, um, and that we live through that. And we also, you know, our, our eggs within our grandmother's bodies, like we are actually physically inside of our grandmothers and how that carries through. And I think thinking about it, not only as trauma carrying through, but also as Maya speaking about the love and the beauty and this, the, the idea of motherhood and how that carries through as well. So there's, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of body, uh, body stuff going on in the film. Um, and can I say with the mouthpiece, the, the, again, the masturbation scene was just like so, so great. Like I, I remember watching Black Swan and seeing that masturbation scene with Natalie Portman. And it was like, who masturbates like that? Like clearly a man is directing this scene. Cause like, she was like, so it just felt so unnatural. And then watching the the mouthpiece masturbation scene. I was like, yeah, that's a, that's how it goes. It's not like, you're not like, I don't know. Anyway, I, I really appreciated all of the decisions you made in terms of the way that, you know, uh, your character's body was represented on screen. And um, yeah, the decision to be like messy and real and all of that was was really powerful. Wow. I just want to flag the some of part of what you both were saying is like was like a spoken word, just beautiful anthem for for indigenous women's bodies and your ethos going into this project is just extremely impactful and inspiring and and the, it shows in the film. I mean, everything you're saying is that is present, which is which is um, no surprise with the amount of thought, careful thought you're putting into each aspect of making this piece of art, which doesn't go without saying, you know, that this level of thoughtfulness and careful, um, just taking into account every angle. Um, with mouthpiece, I think something we were aware of, you know, and we're aware of at all times is, is um, yeah, the filters or how many filters, how many male filters, because there's definitely going to be some or not definitely, but, um, but to remove as many as possible. So to have a, a writer and director and editor and cinematographer and, set dressers and um, designers um, and producers be women um, or female identifying uh, is, is almost like a safety net for it not to be a shitty masturbation scene because also because of this internalized, you know, male gaze, male lens, who's to say <laughs> I might do a fake one or, you know, because that's what I've, all I've ever no seen is the Natalie Portman masturbating. So simil like similarly, I composed the score and we wanted strings to be added to a few of the tracks. And we, and Patricia brought on the musical genius who is Owen Pallett, so much respect for his work. Um, and he added, a bunch of strings to a couple of the tracks and I've never made a movie and I've never made a film score and I listened to them and, and uh, the, the rest of the film score is all female acapella layers and I, I listened to it and I went I don't know if it's good or bad it sounds like a movie though it sounds just like a movie unlike the rest of it this now sounds like movie music and I wrote this to Patricia I was like so so we should keep it, right? <laughs> and she wrote back, what are you talking about? Like snap out of it. Do you like it? Does it, does it, does it, um, 
you know, like, and I was like, oh yeah, right. No, I guess, I mean, no. <laughs> and then Owen was like, yeah, no, me neither. <laughs> you know, like, it's just so easy to revert back to what you know, which has been filtered through men, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so when approaching every aspect of mouthpiece, including the physicality, um, that was always present that that you know the filters that are there and and uh, especially yeah the cinematographer Catherine Lutz we felt very very safe in her hands and extremely safe in Patricia's hands and we have never acted as on film as Nora was saying and, and we're used to directing ourselves as performers on stage as well so for me this was the first time in a long time, I've put myself in somebody's hands as a performer, and uh, I felt I felt really taken care of. Um, which, again, and I keep reiterating, like I can't imagine it any other way. Uh, so, it was a real gift. I would also add to that something that we talked about and thought about a lot, both in the play and the film, is that we are two skinny white women, and to be putting ourselves in the media yet again was something that we had to contend with and you know there's a lot of ways in which we tried to manipulate that um one of which as amy's saying is is who was in charge of the decisions a lot of times it was also like fighting the hair and makeup people to let us look uh messier um uglier less perfect in the movie sense. Um, it was important to us that there was um, a realness to the way, way that we were looking as much as um, we could elbow our way into, like they would come fix our hair and we <laughs> fuck it up again right before rolling because it was like, you know, you don't, you always see women with perfect hair or perfect skin um, and people are just Photoshopping pimples out, like leave the pimples for the, like, we need, you, you know, representation in all kinds of ways. And in the, in the play, there's a whole section where we, because we were making Mouthpiece the play and we suddenly hit a wall and we were like, who the fuck are we to be standing up on stage and taking up space and, and why and how, you know, we're privileged white straight women with, middle class upbringings and we can't and we're getting up and and like really taking up a lot of room and putting our voice out there and we realized we just had to put it in we had to acknowledge that within the piece of art and um call ourselves out on it and own it and kind of dismantle it by understanding that shutting up and sitting down also isn't great but not saying anything about your privilege doesn't work either. So we, we tried, we had, um, I think it ended up in the movie in a very small little, there's like a little moment of it in, in the end of the film, which is a bit less, the film is like less angry than the play. The play we really, we're really angry and we yell a lot. Um, but yeah, I guess when we, like as someone who has struggled with my body throughout my life and the representation of women's body in the media playing a large part in that, I really wrestled with like, what do I do here? Like, I'm, I don't want to add to the pile of That's a great frozen face. <laughs> <laughs> She'll come back. She'll go back. Oh, we've lost her entirely. Okay, well, hopefully she'll come back in a sec. Oh, there, oh, there we go. I disappeared. <laughs> it's okay. I was rambling. 
I can stop now. You were saying don't want to contribute to the pile of toxic. Yeah. So I get, I get what, I, what I said after that was just <laughs> that it was a series of small decisions throughout the uh, writing and creation of like every time. And, and it's good that there's two of us because we could watch each other on the monitor or, or just be calling each other out when it was like, are you doing that because you think you'll look good doing that? Or are you doing that because it feels truth, truthful? Or are we writing this in a way that is representative of something we've seen before that's through a patriarchal gaze or a, a specific lens? Or are you doing that because it's the, the story we want to tell? So, but it, you have to stay vigilant. Like every, every little choice was a, uh, you, you, we couldn't be relaxed into it. It was staying active and alert to, to how, how bodies in general were being shown and seen. Um, I want to ask you about um, your experience with editing and collaborating with the editor um, on your films, and then we'll get into our audience Q&A. Um, do you want to go first, um, Kathleen and, and Maya? Sure. Um, as we said when we were speaking before we started, our editing process was super short. Uh, because of the nature of the film. We were filming in a continuous take with uh, stitch points because we were uh, shooting on 16 millimeter. Uh, we only had rolls of 11 minutes. So we had to have these sort of pre-choreographed points where the camera could be swapped out for another camera pre-rolling. So we had our editor come in from Norway because it was a co-production with Norway. Um, and we sat with him and our editing mentee and made jokes for two weeks <laughs> and then we were done. But no, we had a, he, he was really wonderful to work with. Um, we had a lot of tough choices to make in terms of which performances we chose. Um, we didn't have as many choices to make because we only have 23 cuts in the film. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of, Again, just conversation uh, with with myself and Elmaya, and just saying, "What do you think?" And we would try something and go too far, and then come back. Um, mostly to do with the prologue scenes. Um, after we'd made our choices about performance for the for the majority of the film, the one take um, that was sort of set. There really wasn't a lot we could do to you know, change anything because it just, it is what it is. And um, that was why we chose to do that way. We wanted to lean into that sort of slowness and the silences and the um, awkward moments. Yeah, but it was just a lot of trial and error until we tried every possible uh, option, I think. <laughs> I know um, our sound, our sound design, um, I think really uh, impacted the overall film. Like we had, um, as Kathleen said, it was a Canadian Norwegian co-production. So we had our sound designer come over from Norway and he recorded um, this neighborhood and, um, you know, cause places sound different. Um, and so we were able to, to make or amplify creative choices through our sound design as well. So that was really cool, just being able to make very subtle adjustments or build in a soundscape that didn't exist when we filmed. Um, so yeah, there had there were interesting ways of, of um, building on our very limited um, source material options. Can I ask how many, how many times did you film the whole loop, the whole adventure? Uh, we had five takes. So we did once a day for five days. And then we had a couple of shoot days for the other scenes. One of the days we didn't finish. Uh, 
our relationship with the editing was we were brought in at certain stages uh, with Patricia and Laura, uh, our editor supreme. Um, and uh, <laughs> I just, I recall, I recall everybody telling us, don't worry, you're going to want to, you're going to want to pack it in when you see the rough cut, like, don't worry, it's normal. It's going to be horrendous. And Nora and I saw the rough cut and we were like, this is great. <laughs> Love this movie. <laughs> uh, you know, it, a lot needed to, we changed a lot, but it, yeah. So the relationship, I mean, it was, it's so fascinating. It kept evolving and we would give notes every, every, at every stage of the process during the editing. Um, and it was the penultimate, or it was like, okay, the film is finished now. And we went into the viewing room and we watched it and Patricia had to leave. And it was Laura and Nora and I and the sound people. And every time we'd viewed it until up until then we laughed and we cried. And this time we watched it and Nora and I were like, the movie's broken. Oh, what's happened? Like, is it just, we've watched it too many times, but I don't feel anything. And but then Patricia watched it. She was like, the movie's broken. And everyone was like, what happened? And Lara figured out it was just the volume of the sound at the, at the very end fixed everything. And it was that, a mix, right? It was the mix of was text mix. versus music. Yeah. Had been adjusted. The music and it, was in the back and it should have been in the front. And uh, the subtlety, just an example of the subtlety of the editing process, you can kill a movie. <laughs> you know, uh, if it's at the wrong time, pivotal point in the film. So uh, yeah, she saved the day again. Um, I don't know, do you have anything else to say about our editing? I mean, as I was saying before, I, f I just personally found it so, uh, because we'd never done it before, I didn't realize what a huge collaborator the editor was. You know, we wrote a script, but it didn't end up. It's not a carbon copy of what we had written. It was totally different. There were, we filmed like two other huge musical numbers that got totally cut from the film because they didn't serve the film and a bunch of stuff we had to, we had to do some pickups because we needed things. And that was all because through editing, Laura was rewriting the movie and I just found it so fascinating that like, as Amy's saying, but in different ways, in every way, like if you if you cut a frame two frames before can totally change the meaning to two frames later. And if you put that shot, that B-roll shot of a bird there, as opposed to there, it can totally make you cry or not make you cry. And the fact that it's so sensitive and the editor has to be also assertive and make their own choices that may not be the ones that the that the writers were making is I, I I was just totally blown away and and we were lucky also again that they kept asking our opinion they wanted us to they wanted us to influence the cut and we did we had we had a lot of input into into how it ended up and we did, yeah, we didn't feel like it was taken away from us at all at any point. But I was also just in awe of the editor. Just every time we went into the, into the studio, it was like, <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> what are you doing in here? Dark room every day. Um. I was just going to say also they, they become your therapist as well when you're in there for too long. So it's a very important relationship. Um, I, I guess we, Alex, we're going to Q&A, right? Cool. Um, amazing. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to bring Laura onto the mic who had a question for you. Alex, could you do that? Yep, Laura, you should be able to speak. You just turn on your... Hi. Um, oh, yeah. uh, first of all, thank you so much for this chat today. I thought it was really informative and obviously inspiring to somebody who's emerging as a playwright filmmaker myself. Um, 
and I really uh, thought both the films were so incredibly moving. Uh, mouthpiece for reasons like I lost my mom to cancer, so I found the film devastating. And then um, The Body Remembers, I just, I, I, lo I loved it in so many ways. I, I thought it was really, really impactful on me in terms of the way that you uh, demonstrated safe housing and the hard decision that comes with that when you're at that crossroads. Um, I found that very universal. And I, I don't know if I've actually seen a film that demonstrates that in such a way, in such a touching and um, uh, vulnerable way. I wanted to ask a question. Um, you talked about it a little bit in terms of The Body Remembers. Uh, working with your cinematographer, I found the film really interesting because it did have that kind of documentary feel. And I'm wondering how early did you have the cinematographer in the process? You talk about the rehearsal process being four weeks. Was the cinematographer a part of that process as well? In terms of actually for this young actor who has no experience on camera, was the camera a part of that rehearsal process? Were there look tests? Were there like look books created in terms of the feel that you wanted? I'm just curious about how you incorporated other members of the crew into that rehearsal process and also to create this safe space that you talk about. Sure, um, yeah, so thank you for, for all your kind words. Um, uh, we invited Norm into the rehearsal space uh, quite early on. Uh, it was important for us that Norm and Violet grew comfortable with each other so Violet could trust Norm. Um, and then given the nature of doing the continuous uh, take it was important that everything was choreographed so um, as we confirmed each location we were able to build that choreography into the rehearsal space and so Norm came in and we spent a lot of time shot listing and building each scene visually with him um, and then we had five full days of um, crew rehearsal so we did a run through I guess it would be like like tech check or or dress rehearsal in the theater setting, but we had five full days of full crew rehearsal, um, which was so wild and really, really cool. And I think um, was like really critical to building the, the final sort of show, I guess you'd call it. Um, yeah, and in, in terms of the safe space you were asking about, uh, that was a lot of sort of routine we developed, I think, throughout the rehearsal, just having um, a habit of, of checking in and um, um, making sure there was a, an elder on set for Violet to, to decompress with after if she needed to. Um, and it turned out, we didn't know this at the time, but um, it turned out this person was a member of her family, which was really wonderful uh, to find out. Um, yeah, I think just also just making sure that she had the option of, of quitting. I think that's a strange thing. And it was a lot of stress for us um, <laughs> because if she quit, we'd be, you know, hooped. But I think that was really important for us to put on the table for her early in the rehearsal process, just because she was so young and she didn't really understand from the start the responsibility she was taking on and, and the kind of pressure there would be and uh, the amount of work. It was a ton of work. Um, so just making, you know, making it clear to her that it was just a movie we were making and she could walk away. That's so cool. Um, yeah, I guess I have a follow up question about her as an actor, what about her made her the character of Rosie? What were, what were the qualities that came to when you, I'm assuming you had a casting process of auditions. I'm just sort of curious to know what about this actor in particular struck you? Well, we went through the conventional casting process of um, seeing professional actors, um, but there's a certain quality that lived experience brings to the screen. Um, and we also 
you know, it's important to acknowledge that in this industry, uh, conventionally attractive thin women are the ones who get cast often. Um, and so we kept seeing um, really talented and also very like conventionally attractive actors audition for the role. And we weren't feeling as though we were getting like the sort of raw vulnerability and like realness that that we wanted. Um, we were also inspired by Andrea Arnold and, and the way that she often casts um, first time actors. Um, so we decided to go the um, through the open casting call route and that's how we found Violet. And um, there was just like so much about her that is really, really special. And I think we kind of knew immediately. I don't know, Kathleen, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think just, um, she's just a natural empath. Like she takes on other people's emotions and, and it just like plays out on her face. She can't really hold back um, from that, which is was so incredible. Even as for me, uh, working with her, um, I, you know, I felt like I was going to her for comfort, <laughs> which I shouldn't have been doing. But, you know, she was just that kind of person that that is so deeply invested in other people's feelings. And um, that really showed on camera, I think. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Awesome. Um, so next we have a question from an anonymous attendee uh, who asks, what does the female gaze mean to each of you? So I suppose Amy and Nora, one of you, do you want to start? Um, Amy? I mean, I think I, oops, I just saw. I think I, I think I touched upon it earlier um, in terms of the positive, the positive aspects of female gaze is reclaiming my own eyeballs and the brains and the heart and the soul attached i mean attempting to when nora and i write we often say like well we're screwed but maybe we can help the next generation be a, a slightly less screwed um i mean in when we write when we create work we are constantly unpacking and, and then more unpacking and then deeper, deeper and unpacking that and because it goes down so deep and is rooted so, um, so early on in one's life and trickles down from uh, our mothers and our grandmothers and um, the, the male gaze, I mean, the, the internalized male gaze that in, to attempt to claim or reclaim uh, my own being a female identifying my own gaze is really hard. It's like constant work. And as, as I was speaking before about trying to limit the male filters and we did the same thing with the play. Uh, we didn't want to show it. We didn't even want to show it to any any men not that we have anything against men we just didn't want any men male hands on it we just wanted to see what would happen if it if a story that is essentially about what it feels like to be one this one woman what this one woman feels like and what what it's like in her head what if there were no male hands on that story um I mean, what is a female? Uh, I, I, I take this question and, and, and answer it in a way. My answer is, is 
how <laughs> how to achieve a female gaze I find really really difficult I don't know it's like um we're constantly we constantly talk about it and and outside of creating work it, it's a it's as Nora has touched upon we have the asset of each other to call each other on our shit and I mean a large contributor to us feeling like shit all the time as women is consuming more and more toxic garbage and a lot of that toxic garbage is really comforting um and we we call each other out you know like I just want to watch Bridget Jones diary because <laughs> I'm tired <laughs> to say no because you can't unsee that you can't unknow those stupid like adages like if you don't aren't kissing on new year's eve then you'll never get a man <laughs> like something ridiculous like that to uh so we're just constantly thinking about how not to contribute and how to as much as possible try to especially if we're telling the story about what it is an aspect of what it is to be a woman or be a mother we are yeah, we're, we're constantly fighting to reclaim that female gaze. That was a really convoluted way of answering the question. But I think my, the way I'm answering is reflecting how complex it feels to me uh, and how it's a different battle on a different day. Okay, I'll jump in here. <laughs> Um, I think I have a complicated uh, relationship with the term female gaze, I think. Um, to me, it's less about female or male gaze and more just about experience and empathy and understanding of, you know, telling a story that you can understand from an emotional perspective. Because I think, you know, there are men that tell beautiful stories about women. There's women that tell beautiful stories about men, but they can do it because there's something about that story that speaks to them from a place of, of, of honesty. And I think to say, to separate it in this, you know, binary again is, is not really moving forward. I think it just needs to be about gaze and perspective and not female, male. That would be my two cents. Do you want to go, Nora? <laughs> yeah, I second that. I know it, it was like coined by Jill Soloway or something in some number of years ago. And I think, um, it's about ownership and truth, about reflecting. Oftentimes, the way in which Amy and I write is just by going, we only know what we know, and we only have our own story, and that's that's ours to tell. But we don't have someone else's story to tell, and we don't want to try unless, as you were saying, Kathleen, it's like something that's a truth inside of me. And I think that as opposed to what, I mean, I can think about being in front of the camera and thinking about how I'm coming off based on every other movie I've seen. And in that way, I can understand the difference between these binaries that have been defined. But I think that as a writer or as an actor, it's about tapping into truth and not um not appropriating not appropriating someone else's story um yeah i i have a complicated relationship with the term female obviously because of the way that patriarchy has created these systems of like binary thinking and and looking at gender through the binary um and i think as an indigenous woman this has been talked about a lot before is, is how indigenous women 
girls um, and two-spirit trans queer people um, experience patriarchy twofold. One is um, the sort of general patriarchy that we all experience, I think, as women identifying or just people who don't fall into the, the standard like straight white male category. Um, uh, so we all experience that, that form of patriarchy. And then we also experience the patriarchy um, that has been, uh, that has been um, internalized and, and placed within our mm -hmm. nation's um, ways of relating within our kinship and our justice systems and, and all of that. So um, like right now, my next narrative feature um, will be a, a queer love story. And I just, just before this session, I just had uh, two days of really lovely conversations with other Blackfoot um, uh, LGBTQ2S folks. Um, and we were talking about language and like, what are, the, what are the terms for people who are gender non-conforming or people who are queer? And we didn't know, like a lot of those words are lost, that language is is gone because it's been erased by settler colonialism and it's been erased by Christianity and, and residential schools. And so um, for me thinking about how to uh, reclaim that in my work, it's about, um, yeah, it's about reclamation and it's about um, generosity and, and love because I think that's how we've survived as a people. Um, there's this Blackfoot term, Kimabi Bitsin, which is, it's the title of my, my documentary that I'm working on right now. Um, and it's about, it's about giving empathy and kindness. And I think it's inherently rooted in, um, in kinship and motherhood um, and thinking far ahead into the future and also thinking about um, the ancestors that we have to be accountable to as well. And so, um, in terms of my work as a filmmaker, I try and implement all of that when I think about dismantling the patriarchy, whatever that means. I think it, it, it's about um, thinking about generosity and love um, as forms of like radical resistance. Um, and it's about reclamation um, and, and understanding that um, it's a very complicated road forward um, and that I have a lot to unlearn as well. Mm. Um, well, to round this off, uh, we have one last audience question. I think it's uh, a good way to kind of bring us back to where we started uh, in terms of talking about collaboration. Um, so on YouTube, Dylan Eli asks, for young artists not used to co-writing or co-directing, what would you say are reasons to work with a co-writer or co-director versus reasons to write and or direct individually? Um, I would say uh, it, it like it sounds more complicated to collaborate, but actually in a lot of ways it's it makes it easier. It, it makes the material better if you have a collaborator that you trust and respect and sort of share the same vision with because it's like um, you have two minds and two hearts making these decisions together and um, and it's like you it, I don't, it just feels like the work is all it, it benefits from from that having this 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 process of collaboration um, and I think our film is so much stronger than it would have been if just one of us had made it Yeah, and I think it's important to work if you if you're thinking about collaborating with someone to find someone that you really admire, um, you know, someone that challenges you and, and brings your elevates your work. So maybe you have different skill sets, or maybe you know, just someone that you that you can really trust and really throw your your heart into the work together. then we should we should collaborate with them. I think oh I think uh 
yeah, two brains are better than one. It's also a way to be learning while you're making because you have a teacher and you have someone who has a different experience than you who can always be bringing that into the room. And it it's never, um, you're never coming from a place of, uh, of, well, I know, I know this, so I'm doing this. It's always a, a place of curiosity because you have to be asking more questions when you have someone else in the room with you. So I think it, it invites a kind of growth in all three dimensions into a process, which is for me as an artist, what I'm always looking for on a project is, is growth and learning. It's also more fun. <laughs> You know, the writing anyway, and sitting in a room by yourself. It's more fun and more perspectives. Just It's just richer, we, we find, the collaborative work, whether it's two or, or more, more perspectives, it's just inherently richer. And it's also like accountability as well. It's like you, you, have, you have this other person that you're responsible to like collaborate with and get the work done with and I, I think our process went a lot faster because there, there were two of us and we had this you know we had deadlines that we actually set for each other and we had to we had to just do it together whereas I find that like when I'm doing a project by myself I can just take forever doing it because well I'm just doing it alone <laughs> really so yeah there's a lot of great reasons to collaborate but as Kathleen said it's really important you find a collaborator that you can trust and that you respect and um, who challenges you. Um, well, amazing. Thank you guys so much. Um, that is, I guess that's all this week for Lockdown Film School. And we won't actually have another session for about a month, but we will be coming back on October 4th. Um, with Mouthpieces director Patricia Rosema, which is going to be fantastic. Everyone should tune in. Um, and before we go, just like to thank all four of you again for taking the time out for this session. I think, I mean, I think I speak for all of us when I say it's been so wonderful and insightful to hear your chat of our collaboration. Yeah, thank you Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank well, you. Thank you guys. Nice. And nice to meet you both. Yeah, nice to meet you all. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, hopefully sometime soon in real <laughs> physical spaces. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so take care. Bye, Bye everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.